Hey there. Ready for a deep dive where computers meet philosophy? We're exploring l'art d'être libre au temps des automates, or the art of being free in the age of automata. We're going to see if technology can really help us, you know, understand ourselves. And we're kicking things off with a real-world example, a software called, get this, Quantic Potential Measurement, or QPM. It was featured in a Le Monde article called, wait for it, The Machine That Detects Personality. Okay, a machine that analyzes your personality. That's a bold claim, to say the least. I'm hooked already. So how does it even work? Well, it analyzes your bioelectricity, you know, the electrical activity that's always happening throughout your body. So, like, our heartbeats, brain waves were basically walking circuits. Exactly. And QPM says those electrical signals, they hold the key to our personality traits, emotions, even our potential in different areas. Hold on, hold on. It's saying, like... My spleen's electrical activity can predict how easily I'll learn a new language or something. That sounds like something straight out of sci-fi. It's definitely out there. And the book's author, oh, he had the same skeptical reaction. Totally understandable. In fact, he decided to put QPM to the test himself. He actually visited their facility twice. And wasn't he, like, going through a breakup right before his first test? Yeah. Crazy timing. Mm. I can't imagine volunteering to have my inner electrical system, like, analyzed right after a breakup what happened it's wild during that first visit even the qpm representative was like hmm this recent emotional upheaval might have skewed the results can you believe that even the machine's advocate acknowledging the whole human emotion thing wow so did the second visit did the results like match up with the first one here's the thing even with the time between tests and him you know trying to approach it with a different mindset the results they were surprisingly similar both times. That is fascinating. I can totally see why the author was drawn to this whole experience. Mm. It's like, on one hand, this machine is spitting out data about your supposed true self. But then on the other hand, you're left wondering, can it really grasp what it means to be human, especially after a big life event? Exactly. And that's where things take a philosophical turn. The author brings in Gottfried Leibniz, a 17th century philosopher. This guy was way ahead of his time. Leibniz was fascinated by the I Ching, binary systems just like the ones our computers use today. He even imagined a universal language and, get this, machines that could predict the future through binary calculations. It's like a direct line from the 1600s to our algorithm-obsessed world. So we've gone from, like, measuring bumps on heads to analyzing electrical impulses. But the big question remains. Okay. Can we really quantify and predict human behavior and experience? Exactly. The author seems to be wrestling with that very question throughout the book. He even talks about this story from the mathematician Norbert Wiener about this old couple, right? They wished for money, and tragically, they received it. But it was compensation for their son's accidental death. Oh, wow. That's heartbreaking. It makes you think, right? Even if a machine could predict events, human interpretation, free will, it all plays a huge role in how those events really impact us. It's about way more than just cold, hard data. All right, we bring our own baggage, our own experiences to everything. We're not just, like, a collection of data points. Mm -hmm. The author talks about this idea of default mode. Mm -hmm. And it applies to both humans and indeed machines. Machines, they usually stick to their programming. But humans, we're anything but predictable. Exactly. We can, you know, deviate, improvise, make choices based on values and emotions, things a machine can't quite do no matter how sophisticated the algorithm is, you know. And that's where I think this whole myth information idea is so important. Ah, yes. Langdon Winner's big idea, right. It challenges this assumption that more information equals more freedom. Exactly. Just look at how much information bombards us every day. I mean, social media, news feeds, targeted ads, it's too much. Sometimes it feels like all this information, it's paralyzing, not empowering. It's like drinking from a fire hose. You get a few drops, maybe, but mostly you're just overwhelmed, right? right? And maybe even misled because there's so much coming at you. And that's where that example winner gives about those two activist groups. That really hits home for me. You've got ground zero, totally gung-ho about tech and spreading information. And then there's the nuclear weapons freeze campaign, much more grassroots, you know, face-to-face -face building community. And as we know, it was the nuclear weapons freeze campaign that actually had the bigger impact. Maybe because of or even despite being less tech-focused, you know? It's a good reminder that Real change, lasting change, it often comes down to human connection, shared purpose. Don't get me wrong, access to information, that's critical, of course. But it's what we do with it, how we interpret it, how we act on it, that's what really counts. 
It circles back to that idea of agency, which the author talks about when he gets into shock testing and how it plays into social control, you know? Ever heard of this book, Silent Weapons for Quiet Wars? I haven't, actually. What's that one about? Oh, it gets into this really unsettling possibility of using, get this, cybernetics to basically manufacture predictable economic behavior in people. Like, imagine if the powers that be could manipulate everyone to just prioritize profit over everything else. Now, that is chilling. Okay, yeah, I see why understanding those systems, the ones pulling the strings, is so crucial. Otherwise, we're just puppets. Right? Exactly. But the good news is, seeing those forces at work, that's the first step to breaking free. And that's where the author brings in this empowering idea of the creolist. Okay, creolist, break that down for me. Okay, so think of it this way. A creolist gets that reality isn't, like, fixed. It's fluid, always being shaped by our choices and actions. Just like, you know, a, a sculptor with clay. We have the power to create our own lives. That is a powerful way to think about it. It's not about just accepting what we're given. It's about actively shaping our reality, building a life based on our values. I like it. Right. And technology, it can be a tool in that creative process. It doesn't have to be this thing that's like dictating our thoughts and actions. The key is to use it consciously, intentionally. So how do we become more like those creolists, especially in a world that's practically drowning in tech? Well, awareness is a big part of it, what we've been talking about. But it goes beyond just recognizing how powerful tech is. It's about, you know, questioning assumptions, finding different perspectives, being willing to challenge the status quo. So not rejecting technology, but learning to use it in a way that you know, actually aligns with our values and helps yes. us create real change in the world. Exactly. And the author also mentions biometrics and how they're being used more and more for surveillance control. What are your thoughts on that? It's a double-edged sword for sure. On one hand, yeah, things like facial recognition, fingerprint scanning, they can make things more secure. But then again, you can't deny the potential for misuse. It's easy to imagine those tools being used to, you know, chip away at our privacy, silence dissent. People become afraid to speak their minds. Exactly. Like that panopticon idea the author talks about. If we think we're constantly being watched, it creates this atmosphere of, you know, self-censorship, conformity. Not good. It's a slippery slope, no doubt. Yeah. So how do we, you know, how do we make sure we're using these technologies for good, not just like sleepwalking into some kind of dystopian surveillance state? The million dollar question, right. The author seems to be pushing for a two pronged approach. You know, first, we've got to become more tech savvy ourselves. He actually says that understanding the language of technology, even learning to code it, can really empower us to create our own tools, our own systems. OK, so not just using tech, but creating it, understanding it from the inside out. I like it. Exactly. And the second part, which he seems even more passionate about, it's about shifting our mindset. He uses this phrase, reclaiming the magic, which really stuck with me. Reclaiming the magic. Okay, I'm intrigued. What's that all about? It's about getting back to that sense of wonder, you know, that anything is possible, that feeling of being connected to something bigger than ourselves. Remembering we're not just cogs in some machine, we're living, breathing beings. We have this capacity for creativity, for love, for compassion. I feel like in this world, you know, always connected, always on, it's easy to lose sight of that. Absolutely. And the author argues that rediscovering that magic that's key to building a future where human beings, we come first, not technology. He even talks about the open source software movement, how it's a great example of tech being used to, you know, encourage collaboration, sharing, collective empowerment. Oh, that's a perfect example. It's not about hoarding information, hoarding resources. Yeah. It's about breaking down those old hierarchies, working together, building something good for everyone. Exactly. And this whole idea of collective action, of coming together to shape our reality, it comes up again and again in the book. He even brings up the Chilean Cyber Folk Project, which, while it didn't pan out in the end, was trying to create this real-time communication system between the government and its people. Wow. It's amazing how technology can be both a tool for control, but also a platform for, like, real democratic participation. It really comes down to who's in the driver's seat, right? And that's why the author keeps hammering home this point about individual agency, about collective action. We can't just passively accept whatever technology, whatever systems are handed to us. We have to question them, challenge them. We have to actively shape the world we want to live in. It feels like we've like barely scratched the surface of this book. Mm -hmm. From bioelectricity to reclaiming the magic, it's a lot to take in. We just dipped our toes in, really. But the biggest takeaway for me, 
The future isn't just something that happens to us. It's something we create through the choices we make, the actions we take. Mm -hmm. It's about believing a better world is possible. Beautifully said. It's a powerful reminder that even when things feel overwhelming, we have choices. We can create. We can make a difference. Absolutely. And that power. It doesn't just come from what we do as individuals. It comes from our collective efforts. You know, we're all in this together. So true. Well, on that note, it's time to wrap up this amazing deep dive. But before we go, I want to leave our listeners with something the author wrote. The choice is yours. Are you awake? Wow. Powerful stuff. Are we just sleepwalking through life, letting the systems control us? Or are we awake, engaged? Are we using our creativity, our agency to build a future that's actually worthy of us? Those are some really great questions for all of us to consider. And on that note, that's all the time we have for today. Thanks for joining us on this incredible deep dive. And until next time, keep learning, keep questioning, and keep creating the world you want to see.